While Luke John uh, was a developer at Seven West Media, he led the adoption of CSS in JS at the West Australian and at Perth Now, and he's also a leading contributor to the CSS in JS framework Glamorous. He's going to tell us all about using CSS in JS with type systems like TypeScript or Flow with TypeSafe CSS and JS. Please welcome Luke. So, as you just heard, I'm here today to talk about type safety and CSS and JS, um, both of which are very shiny, quite new, um, and are really fun to work with. Um, so, just a bit of background around how we got to type safety and CSS and JS. Um, we've had this uh, massive rise of JS everywhere. Um, we've got frameworks like React and Angular, um, and as those frameworks got bigger and more mature, um, we've started to see type systems um, from the likes of Facebook and Microsoft, um, where you'll have uh, some level of type safety with your JavaScript, um, and that language will just compile to uh, JavaScript, and it helps make uh, those large code bases a bit more maintainable um, and flexible for future usage. Um, so, on the CSS in JS side of things, we should probably start with what CSS outside JS is. Um, with these modern frameworks where you're doing component-based development, um, your markup uh, is a function of state. It's quite easy to understand based on this URL and flowing through your uh, JSX, if you're using React, um, exactly what markup you're going to be getting. Um, when it comes to styling side of things, uh, it's a bit more of an unknown. A lot of frameworks will be having, will be importing perhaps four different CSS uh, external files. Um, then they might be using Webpack loaders for SAS to have some level of component-based styling, um, but the CSS is um, not necessarily determinable based on just state. Um, CSS in JS, um, both your markup and your styling is a function of your state. Um, so based on a URL or a user being logged in, you can work out exactly what styles and only those styles are actually created for the page. Um, so it enables uh, pattern uh, things like critical CSS um, and really helps out if you're doing server-side rendering to only shoot down uh, the uh, CSS which is needed for any particular page. Um, so it's really awesome. Um, so. As we started there before, um, a, a lot of this talk is going to be using uh, React. Um, however, CSS in JS uh, exists with a bunch of the other frameworks now. Um, but when you add type safety to something like React and CSS in JS, um, you start to live in the happily ever after where things are really shiny and you um, enjoy coding all the things. Um, so we'll just start with uh, where uh, CSS in JS started. Um, the term uh, was first popularized by inline styles in React, um, where as you're doing your templating um, inside your JSX there, there's a style property um, available, which you can just add some inline styles. Uh, those will get added in line in your um, resulting HTML markup. Uh, but then later on, other frameworks saw that pattern, thought this is really awesome, and they uh, created some other handy uh, helpers that would um, extract all of that and put it into your head or do other things, but the basic pattern was um, very similar. Um, and this example here is actually got it turned on with TypeScript. Um, we'll just have a look at the typings for where we started with type safety in CSS and JS. Um, they just typed a subset of CSS um, properties. Um, for some of them, they had um, pretty strong type safety, so this aligned content um, property here, um, you'll get autocomplete on the uh, uh, key and the value. Um, and if you do a misspelling, um, which is uh, quite uh, common in CSS, um, you'll get immediate um, feedback about that. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of CSS properties that uh, allow quite uh, flexible um, values, um, border 10 pick solid red. You can't give type safety for that sort of thing um, just using this pattern. So they're just typed as strings. Um, so this was the inline styles uh, popularized by React. Um, what was happening in JS about the same time is the language was getting uh, 
uh, new features. One particular new features were template literals, of which um, the more advanced uh, version was the tagged template literals. And these would allow you to pass template literals with a function. Um, that's that bottom one. That's just grabbed from MDN, MDN the examples. Um, and so people who were doing a lot of React development, who had traditionally been putting a lot of work into other solutions for CSS at scale, um, saw this and thought, wow, um, we could do some really awesome stuff with this. Um, that slide is far too small to um, see, I um, uh, apologize, but essentially you've got a uh, function up the top there that you've set up, um, which would allow uh, users to use a string as an API for writing their CSS within JavaScript um, and then have uh, expressions within that. Um, of course, this is a bit of a back step when it comes to type safety for CSS in JS because we've gone back to a, a string interface um, and you're not going to get a lot of safety there. Um, however, it really popularized the props-based styling um, pattern um, where you could have uh, functions which you could pass props to, so where you're doing component-based development, you could pass props into what was ever creating your CSS, um, and rather than having three different class names that you're going to select from based on those props, you could just write the exact CSS in each case, um, which was really handy. And here's just an example um, using uh, styled components. Um, uh, you get autocomplete on the uh, DOM tags um, of the interface, but then once you're inside that uh, tag template, um, you uh, have no real safety. Um, but then down below there, what you can see is uh, you using, so that then returns a React component, uh, which you can just use uh, inside your JSX, so inside your templating, um, and it has the props flowing through quite nicely. So then we had uh, Glamorous um, came out uh, early-ish last year, I think about April, um, and it followed on from some of the APIs that had been uh, pioneered by the styled components people, um, but they quite liked the CSS object um, interface for writing your CSS, um, so they mixed that pattern of having component factories with CSS objects. Um, and this was really exciting for where I was working at the time. Um, we'd been using processes, peer review uh, conventions such as BEM, um, to protect our code base from bad things happening. Um, this was working for most of the time uh, for our front end devs with strong CSS knowledge. Um, however, that wasn't all of us. Uh, we had people with a range of experience across domains. Um, and so bad things were still happening. CSS and JS with something like Glamorous, uh, which we would be able to type, looked like it offered some technical solutions to the problems we were having. So the initial typings, uh, somebody was obviously using it on a project. Um, they'd written some typings internally, and they went to contribute that back to the community. Um, what had been happening a lot of that time was people would put the typings on definitely typed and just sort of, which is a, uh, uh, it's a repo set up by Microsoft, which makes all the types available to install. Um, but about this time, people were starting to bundle definitions with the frameworks. Um, so somebody thought, oh yeah, I'll try and get those landed there. Um, the person who had led the development of it wasn't quite sure about it, um, but the feedback he got, and it's quite true, is that um, it's a lot better for consumers when you have bundle typed. It um, implies that the project is type friendly, be those bundle types uh, flow or TypeScript. Um, and when you change or add something, you can uh, expect a uh, PR shortly to add type support for that um, and a bunch of other things. It does, however, lead to a bit of extra uh, contributor uh, overhead because you've got more activity going on. So those initial um, definitions, they just covered a small subset about the, uh, of the API of Glamorous um, and there was also a clear expectation set around um, how those types would be maintained. It would be up to uh, TypeScript users um, to maintain those, um, which was uh, everybody accepted and was great. Um, what was also very helpful was the project had very clear contribution guidelines. Uh, this provided clear guidance for the initial PR to add them, but also for anybody who wanted to 
extend the type-ins or add additional features. It was very clear how they could add those features and get them landed. Um, so if you're adding types to a framework, highly recommend having contribution guidelines well laid out. Um, so initially, uh, it was set up with the types separated out into a typings folder, which is a fairly standard thing within uh, uh, TypeScript definitions and also flow ones. Um, and then there's just a field you put in your package.json uh, with a, the location of where the typings are for when TypeScript does type acquisition on usage. And uh, it also just had a simple test file. Um, the way testing works for a lot of TypeScript uh, definitions is that they just have a single file that just goes through all the uses that the types provide and make sure that the compiler doesn't generate any error output. Um, and you, as you can imagine, there's some problems with that, but we'll touch on that in a bit. Um, so, uh, sorry, is that showing up there? Ah, oh, fantastic. Um, so, this is uh, just some of the APIs that Glamorous had to give an idea as we jump into the typings that it has, what sort of support it needed, and the range of types. Um, so we just start with some Glamorous DOM and built-in component factories. The second uh, signature there, Glamorous.divs, just a shortcut to the first one. Um, it also had built-in components, so you could just import a uh, div um, from Glamorous name, namespace uh, exports, and also Glamorous.div would work as well. Um, this actually presented a bit of challenge with TypeScript because there's no easy way to share named exports uh, with interfaces for typing, so there was a fair bit of type duplication. Um, also with the glamorous.div for the other built-in component factories. Um, uh, then glamorous could also take components um, when it, you set up a component factory, um, so that needed to be typed. And it also had options which would then change the behavior of the resulting component. Um, so uh, if you set that props our CSS overrides is equal to true, when you finally use that component, uh, you then have available all of the CSS properties as props on that component, which will get added up into the CSS. Um, and then there's also a with component API, which you can uh, change what uh, component the eventuating glamorous uh, component factory returns. So a huge um, API service with things at the top level impacting things a few levels down, um, which was quite interesting. Um, so in terms of type coverage, we'll just touch on uh, initially the CSS and SVG properties. Uh, so we'll start with the, um, these were very similar to the React typings. Um, initially, we just used the React CSS property typings. Uh, then we had a great PR from a contributor who uh, vended those, but then went through property by property um, and checking the MDM documentation and tidying up the types. So for some things such as display um, or float, I think, uh, where uh, the React typings for it would just accept any string, um, it was tightened up a bit. So for the autocomplete, it was really helpful. And for misspellings, it would avoid that. Um, then uh, we just also need to support the pseudo properties. Um, so that's how you would use that. And then when you're using that anywhere where it's been typed, you're going to get um, type safety, which is really handy. You also get autocomplete, um, which is quite wonderful. Uh, then we had a lossy version of the CSS properties. Uh, the way that a lot of the uh, CSS and JS frameworks work with their CSS objects is they support something similar to um, SAS and uh, other things where you can have uh, contextual selectors, but also just for media queries where you have another object underneath that. Um, because of this particular uh, type index that would be getting added onto it, it meant that for the previous CSS objects, um, you actually lose type safety. So whilst if you've typed float correctly, you get type safety on the properties in order to complete. If you accidentally type flat, um, it's going to pass, um, which is a bit sad. Um, there are some other alternative CSS and JS frameworks that uh, have alternative syntax for this sort of stuff. Um, they're not quite as widely adopted, uh, and, uh, but should be interesting in the future. Um, and so then just using it all together, um, it's kind of like CSS, it's just using an object, uh, JS object syntax, um, and it all fits together quite well. So those are just some examples. 
Um, so style arguments, these are the things that uh, when we saw earlier on the uh, Glamorous API, um, you would set up a component factory with either a DOM tag or a component. Um, these are the arguments that you then pass to that to create your CSS. Um, it can take a function which would return uh, some properties or a string or also an array of properties and strings. Um, it would also accept a style array, so an array of all of those things, um, and then a style argument, sort of a combination of those, plus a couple of other signatures that I've just um, taken out of that uh, for brevity's sake. Um, but then for the style arguments, that's for dynamic styles. Um, you can see their props are getting passed through as a generic so that they're available in the style functions. Uh, a lot of the time when you're doing CSS in JS, you won't actually use uh, props flowing through. Um, and so there's also a simpler static style argument, which also, also helps out with the uh, compiler output if something goes wrong. It's a bit simpler in those cases. It's a bit easier to read. Um, and so here's an example of uh, how those types um, are then checked on a component. So here that will pass because it's a CSS properties object um, and the values are correct. Um, here this would pass because it's a function. Um, I haven't actually typed this, but it, the props, if I had a typed on the example component, um, would be typed to something. And then you can use that in determining the output of the display. Um, here it would pass because it's going to return a string. Um, here it would pass because it's going to return an array of all those things. Uh, so um, quite a lot of different things you could do with style arguments um, or uh, with support. And so we'll next look at um, just a single one of the Glamorous API shapes that we saw earlier, where you pass a component factory to the Glamorous function, which will return you a Glamorous component factory. Um, so this is a heavily trimmed down version of the types. Um, so we'll start with the main export from the uh, definitions, which is this Glamorous interface. Uh, then the Glamorous interface, um, this looks really noisy and messy. Um, essentially, it's just an object which takes a component with some optional objects and returns a Glamorous component factories. We've had to use a lot of generics here because of all the different uh, changes that happen downstream in that Glamorous component factory and then the resulting Glamorous component that is created from that um, in order to get type safety there. But you don't actually have to pass uh, any of those generics all the time. Uh, most of the time, if you're doing something dynamic with that component, you'll just pass the props and the rest will just all match together if you've typed it on that component, um, which is really nice. Um, we use overloading with this signature um, because uh, depending on the options that you pass in, uh, again, the signature of the, uh, so the, sh the API of the resulting glamorous component is quite different. It will accept if you've set the props or CSS overrides options to true, a bit down, you can just use uh, those props and so they need to be typed as well. Um, so that's the initial creation. Um, then we get into the actual uh, component factory. So that returns a component factory. Component factories um, just take those generic props and initially we start with a uh, overload for the static styles. Um, we put that at the top because uh, even though it should match uh, down the bottom as well. Um, so the next two we'll see. Uh, there was a bit of a memory leak issue with TypeScript. Um, and uh, this just has uh, CSS properties as arguments, pretty much. Um, you can't do any functions or anything in there. Then we have an overload for if your props have got a theme. So there's a concept of a theme provider in Glamorous, which I won't go into, but essentially um, there's some magical props that can end up on that component and be available for whilst you're doing your styling. Um, and we also use as part of this, um, so we say that when they set up the props for the uh, component factory, so for those functions that return the styles, the theme's going to be available, but then when they, we actually return the glamorous component from this, uh, all those props that are there, they need to be set up, but the theme doesn't. Um, TypeScript doesn't have subtraction types. Emit kind of gives something similar, um, but it does actually pollute the uh, IntelliSense and compiler output. So I would recommend avoiding where possible. 
Um, and then finally, we just have a overload for the uh, component factory where there is just the props, no theme, um, which is quite handy um, and just keeps the types a bit simpler. Uh, and then finally, um, the component factory returns a glamorous component, which is just a React component factory um, with various external props and extra glamorous props. So the external props in some case will just be the props. Sometimes it will be the CSS properties if we had to set that props or CSS overrides earlier on. Um, and then it also has uh, some methods available on it, such as with component, which we saw earlier, which will um, let you have all the props and all the typing, but for a slightly different component, um, which is uh, this one here. Um, and there's a couple of other ones there. So when it was getting typing, typed, initially it started off with uh, just a very small subset of what was available in Glamorous. It was quite understandable, um, uh, easy to use, but there was a lot of stuff that you couldn't do. Um, then we started to add uh, overloads and generics to provide support for both the alternative interfaces, but also the generics to get better type safety on some things that initially that were essentially, um, such as props, just a any, so you didn't have that much safety. Uh, then um, we introduced the emit type um, to support the uh, theme being excluded. Um, it seemed like a really good idea at the time. There was probably an alternative syntax that we could have used using an additional generic, um, but this less magical type. Um, and had we have used that, it would have led to much cleaner compiler output. And when users are having errors, um, easy to understand what's going on. Um, and then uh, eventually we started having to use overloads uh, coupled with generics, which uh, would extend, uh, be extended from things so that we could uh, limit uh, this particular generic to match this shape and then we'll do this thing. Um, and it all got very complicated, very fast. Um, that was a very small subset. Um, in some places there were extra overloads for things like CSS properties versus SVG properties. Um, unfortunately, a limitation of the compiler, uh, TypeScript compiler at this point in time meant that, oh, so the IntelliSense at this point in time meant that if you try and union that there, uh, you would just lose autocomplete. It would still type, but the developer experience would get worsened. Um, so um, pretty massive amount of types. As you can imagine, things go wrong um, when you've got such large types. Um, and the standard uh, definition strategy of just testing what is meant to work and making sure that the compiler succeeds um, wasn't really sufficient to allow additional contributors to easily add things um, and not have to worry about accidentally breaking something else. Um, so we introduced some uh, additional testing. We just set up a should fail file adjacent to the test file. Um, and then we just used just snapshotting to run the compiler on that file as well. Make sure that everything that we'd set up to fail was ending up in that snapshot. Um, and that did pick up quite regularly where people would sort of think, oh, I can just make this change here and not realize that that would actually knock out something else with one of the other um, glamorous interfaces. So really handy pattern. Um, there's some other strategies there now um, that are a little less sort of um, hacky here. We're just using spawn to run the compiler and snapshot it, um, uh, but definitely recommend testing both sides. Um, and also just on the testing side of things, uh, you often find that if you're uh, using Glamorous uh, as part of something that else, which you're generating definitions from, um, it has subtly different behavior with the compiler. Um, so recommend testing in uh, definitions, uh, declarations mode uh, with your tests. Um, another thing that we did with the types in some places uh, was we did things that weren't strictly necessary, um, but uh, they improved the developer experience. Um, in one case, if we used a union for type, uh, the, uh, you would get type safety, but when you're using VS Code or another editor that's using IntelliSense, you would lose uh, autocomplete, um, which was a really handy feature. Um, and people who aren't using TypeScript um, are also getting benefits off it. Um, so we would do some sort of hacky things um, it's worthwhile 
commenting when you do that to make sure that uh, in a couple of months' time, uh, both Flow and TypeScript are moving really rapidly. A lot of things, this one we found after about two months, um, we could actually just move to a spread and a union and it all worked nicely. So worth commenting those things. Sometimes you need to get a bit creative um, when you're setting up types as well or using it with a type system. Um, we had a fun one where the roll-up compilation um, for Glamorous uh, was incompatible with how TypeScript was doing the importing. Um, so we actually added this, uh, this to the main Glamorous source file um, just to allow usage with TypeScript. Um, but where you do get creative with things like this, um, again, it's really worthwhile adding some comments so that the next person knows what's going on. Um, and it's a pretty massive uh, amount of type in there, a large surface area with the API. Um, there were some pretty massive mistakes that were made, uh, which were in most cases uh, quite avoidable. Um, a couple of those, um, one, we had this issue um, opened up. Um, it was quite an interesting one. So there was a memory leak with the typings, which meant that you, when you were using it with a project with a lot of glamorous components, uh, pretty quickly the uh, compiler would um, buff and you would get out of memory errors. It was interesting because the compiler worked fine with tests and depending on project size and also uh, usage of the types, it would just never show up. Um, and the way that it, uh, part of why it happened was there were a bunch of changes to the types getting added to a vnext branch. Um, so nobody was testing them in production. All of a sudden uh, vnext launched there were all these new types that landed um, and so, um, how they interacted led to this memory leak. So it took a few days to sort of work out where that was and get an update going. Um, another one was uh, the definitions can sometimes get um, quite overwhelming. This was a very politely worded issue from somebody um, where they had gone to use the uh, glamorous with TypeScript and the autocomplete was just out of control as you start to type in the arguments you would get this enormous uh, window pop up with all the different options and it would hijack your arrow keys as to go through the different options um, so uh, this one was quite e well in some ways easily solved went back in and restructured uh, some of the typings so that the uh, output for things like IntelliSense, but also just compiler output if there's an error, was more readable and uh, more clear, a bit more concise. Um, and yeah, so uh, definitely recommend limiting type coverage when you're typing a framework like this. Um, if the framework doesn't intend a usage, um, don't type it. Um, there were a couple of PRs landed early on that were landed purely to support some uh, some stuff that had started happening by mistake and was never really intended by the framework or the uh, lead contributors. Um, and because that got typed early, it's hard to remove um, type coverage for anything that you've added um, because people will complain when uh, they do a update and things break for a non-major. Um, also try to ensure types don't make workflows difficult, um, like IntelliSense, as you just saw. And uh, you should always use comments to uh, help consumers. This will win you a lot of love um, for both TypeScript and uh, Flow and just JS developers because in things like IntelliSense for APIs that aren't immediately clear just off the uh, name of that property, they get a little bit of extra information about how to use it. Um, it's also really important with this sort of thing to enable contributors. Um, something really awesome that's happened in the last year is that there's now online uh, play boxes where you can set up a full TypeScript and Flow project and um, import Glamorous and have the sort of definitions being used as you're typing online and uh, getting error output in browser. Uh, so uh, setting up a sandbox for people who are having issues to be able to quickly set up a reproduction along with the uh, issue rather than having to set up a whole repo um, is really handy. And also just obvious things like uh, asking for the version of TypeScript they're using if they are having an issue with the bundled declarations is 
really handy. So we'll now just have a quick look at how you use uh, the CSS and JS with TypeScript. Um, so here we have a uh, glamorous component factory with the styles where we're getting autocomplete on both the property name and then the values that it accepts. Um, really handy, really useful. Um, we'll jump straight from that to this is something uh, we're going to now create with CSS and JS and TypeScript. Um, so it's a reproduction of the LCA schedule um, where the, it starts at a calendar, then just collapse down to a talk by talk by talk um, and gives us some really clean HTML without lots of wrapping divs or reused CSS or anything like that. So we'll start with um, a timetable uh, React component which if we jump into that and have a look at, uh, that's just a glamorous uh, emotion component factory, another CSS and JS framework. Um, we've got our CSS being returned from this. Um, we're gonna use the CSS grid. We're able to use the props um, that that's been typed with, which has a number of active rooms to set up the amount of columns that we want on that. Um, so then if we jump back to the timetable, inside of that timetable, we're going to have uh, time starts, which are just going to show up on the uh, left-hand side, as we saw, um, and pass that through the information it needs to do that. And uh, this is just another React component, which then has the uh, time start uh, H3, um, and then that's going to use the props to set up the CSS to put it in the collect correct row, um, which is nice and handy there, uh, and the correct column as well. Uh, then we'll jump onto the slot. Um, so that's the actual talks as we go through. Uh, they're going to have a, uh, use another component. We'll just have a look at the styled slot. We won't go through all of it. Um, that takes a bunch of props, which go into the styling. Um, again, I've collapsed this, so it doesn't include all the styling required, but it's gonna grab the, uh, using the room index um, it's going to run another uh, method, which gets room color. That just takes a CSS color value and adjusts the hue left and right so that we get the nice colors going along. And we can have sort of infinite amount of rooms or just a few. Um, and then it's going to select the uh, column and the amount of rows that talk should span uh, based on its time start and its time offset. So as we've been going through here, only the CSS that is absolutely required for each of these slots is being generated. Um, in cases where the CSS is in common, it will dedupe those styles automatically for you, so there's no need for by hand deduping. Um, it will be producing a really nice clean markup. There's no need for wrapping divs to sort of enable this kind of nice visual structure. Um, and it's really really easy and fast. So this whole thing took about uh, 20 minutes to get running, um, which normally with CSS would take an enormous, well, might take a bit longer to get all of those uh, grids and calls if you weren't doing it inside of uh, JS and being able to use uh, those patterns. So we'll just have a look at the future of uh, CSS in JS and uh, some of the things that um, type script and flow are enabling. Um, the first one, this is very limited to TypeScript in particular. There's this really cool thing called TypeScript server plugins, which give you uh, that string API for CSS that we talked about earlier on. When that first came around, there's no way to type a string. Um, these server plugins actually allow you to create your own sort of type safety for certain things um, and give uh, autocomplete in uh, editors using IntelliSense and whatnot. So here, we're actually getting type safe uh, CSS strings in JS, um, which is really powerful uh, and I think um, very exciting for the future. Uh, there's also some plays around how you generate types at the moment. Um, for glamorous, as you saw, there was the glamorous.div, uh, cold glamorous with the div string, there was the export, uh, so import div from glamorous. Uh, there was the glamorous dot uppercase div, um, which are all doing fairly similar stuff and using the same sets of types, um, but they have to be typed separately. 
And so with generated typings, um, you can sort of automate uh, some of that, which both uh, makes it a bit easier for contributors. Uh, when they want to make a change to some of those big files, they can just make it in one place, uh, but also gives you a bit more uh, confidence in the definitions, uh, because as it is, there's a fair bit of copy pasting. These are just four of the different files, each of which are a couple of hundred lines long. Um, Another really exciting thing, uh, regex types. Uh, there's a PR open on the uh, TypeScript uh, repository at the moment. Um, it's probably not going to land for a couple of major, a uh, couple of versions, um, but it's been actively discussed um, by the TypeScript team, and uh, looks really exciting, um, not just for CSS and JS, but a whole range of other applications. Um, and so. This isn't actually necessary. This isn't anything to do with uh, TypeScript and CSS and JS. This is just really cool things you can do with CSS and JS um, because it's so shiny. Uh, you can do CSS snapshotting alongside your markup for your components. Um, so if you have things go wrong, um, it's easier to pick up in peer review um, and also just whilst you're developing. Uh, traditionally, your UE snapshots might contain a couple of class names, which you may or may not have set. Um, and really no information about the style rules, but um, this sort of opens up a lot more confidence. Uh, it does generate very noisy uh, tests, however, um, which brings us to visual snapshots, where on a unit level, it's really easy when you're using something like CSS and JS to test that that component is pixel perfect for changes. Um, so what you can see here, uh, and that isn't working, um, is uh, actually, um, you'd never see that if you were just looking at it um, in PR uh, by running the code. But here on the bottom one, something's just a couple of pixels off, um, and you pick that stuff up immediately. It's really, really amazing. Um, so just to summarize some of the points we've touched on, uh, type systems uh, really help keep code maintainable um, and really help enable growth of applications. Um, when you think about CSS and JS, a really nice way to think about it is it's turning, it's adding the styling to be a function of the state in addition to your markup. Um, you can do inline styles, you can have styles thrown up into your head. Uh, you can do both string and object as an API, and you've now got type safety with both of them, thanks to things like the server plugins. Um, the component factories uh, really enable you as a developer with component-based dev to have props impact your styling. Um, in terms of uh, when you're actually setting up definitions and declarations for uh, frameworks, um, developers love them. Um, it's uh, useful if you keep the type simple. It both uh, helps the users and also uh, helps people who want to contribute be able to contribute. Um, and uh, you should test types fail as well as succeed. It sounds really obvious, but within the uh, TypeScript and also Flow communities, the way that testing is happening currently, that is not as common as it should be. Um, you can type a lot more than you think, but you probably shouldn't. Um, it'll just make it harder for people to use the types um, and contribute to them in the future. Um, compilers aren't perfect, but there's lots of ways to work around them. Uh, and uh, yeah, types should enable users and not overwhelm them. Um, if you're interested in CSS and JS, uh, there's an excellent repo on GitHub, CSS and JS 101. I highly recommend checking it out. It has a, a thorough overview of all the different options that are out there currently, um, how you would use them, and the advantages uh, of the various options. Uh, these are also some great people to follow on Twitter. Um, Basara, in particular, when it comes to TypeScript, uh, he wrote a uh, CSS and JS framework with just uh, TypeScript um, and is really excellent. Um, and all of the other ones, uh, Kent Dodds uh, is the creator of Glamorous um, and the other people up there have created other CSS and JS frameworks. Um, really awesome people. And thank you very much. Um, that is CSS and JS and type safety. And I think we've just got a little bit of time for questions. Three minutes.
Just with generated typing, so you've got, uh, you do it once and it generates all the others, what's the best starting point? If we've got variations, no specify them, then we have to keep generated typing, which, which is the best one to do first. Can you repeat the question? Uh, so with generate, so I think the question was, with generated typings, uh, what's the best way to do that currently, where you've got various uh, variations but with common things. Uh, haven't actually done that um, yet. Um, there's some interesting ones, I think uh, TS Spoon um, was one uh, and a few others, uh, but um, there's also things like uh, Babel Preval where if you just have some uh, code that you want to use to generate other code on build, um, enable that quite easily. But I haven't actually dived into that yet. Um, it just looks really exciting. All right.